Well, good evening. Welcome to the Oklahoma History Center. Many of you have been here before. If you haven't, it's good to have you today to join us as we celebrate and talk about the life and career of Mason Williams. Our job here at the Oklahoma Historical Society and Oklahoma History Center is to collect, preserve, and share our history. And as we do that, we try to collect the story of economic development, of American Indian community, 19th century history, but most recently we have started emphasizing the collection of Oklahoma's creatives, as we call them. The people who have an association with Oklahoma, who through their, their experiences, their own personalities, their skills, find a way to entertain, to create art, and find a way to make a living doing that. We will be developing a new museum in Tulsa called the OK Pop that will feature the crossroads of creativity of Oklahomans who have come on to this stage of history and have created something that has entertained us, the people around the country, and people around the world. Well, Bob told you what his job was. Our job at OCU is to encourage, support, uh, and enable creativity. Of course, in Mason's case, we had to sort of restrict creativity a little bit. Uh, but generally, we have to just, uh, it is a delight to be in the house that Bob and his friends built. And it's always a joy for our city's university to work with the History Center. And I was talking with Dean Mark Parker, whose fingerprints are all over this program tonight. I said, Mark, is there, has there ever been anyone as creative, as eclectic, as wonderful, as bizarre, as all-encompassing coming from uh, OCU as Mason, and you are, you're, you're the original thing. Yeah. <clears throat> and we worked with Mason uh, for several years. He joined us in Miami, Oklahoma for a program on coffee house music and some of the musicians who were learning their, their skills and entertaining people in the 19, late 1950s and early 1960s, came together. Mason gave a program, pulled some of his friends onto the stage. I see some of you around the room today who shared with us that experience and that time in Oklahoma history. Well, of course, when I thought about this program again and honoring Mason, I reached out to, to President Henry and said, the OCU experience combined with the Northwest Classen experience in Oklahoma City, here, here. his role as making history as an entertainer and creative person, that this needed to be a collaborative event where we would pull in the students who are learning lessons today that Mason learned 50 years ago, almost, not quite. So it seemed like a natural for another partnership and Robert and I always say that we are bookends on 23rd Street. We're here on this side of town, on down 23rd Street. Between us, we should be supporting and celebrating the arts, creativity, and what's special about Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, and our people. So tonight, uh, we are going to try to do this, kind of bounce back and forth on introducing Mason. We could go on forever. Probably very few people in all of show business would compare if you try to find comparables. The only person that my staff and I could come up with was Steve Martin, musician, a writer, a comic, performer, someone who collaborates on di in different fields of the arts. But Mason's story begins in Oklahoma City where he grew up and graduated from Northwest class in high school. <laughs> He attended Oklahoma City University. He told us some stories that we will not repeat uh, uh, earlier this evening, but he attended Oklahoma City University and did very well there. And he has written more than 250 songs, some of which we cannot share with you tonight, but we have heard some of those stories today. He was nominated for five Grammys, and he won two Grammys. He was a... Yes, 
He was a writer for the Roger Miller comedy show on network television at the national level and a good friend. And his talents blended with Roger Miller. And when we talk to musicians around the country who know music in Oklahoma, and they think of Roger Miller, and they think, what a brilliant man. And we've heard some stories today about that experience. And you brilliant OCU students, uh, you have not reached the advanced uh, age that will make you fully appreciate this, but Mason was the head writer for the Smothers Brothers comedy show. Mason has been nominated for two Emmys, and he has won an Emmy for the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. He won a Writer's Guild Award for Steve Martin's All Commercials. And he has written 15 books. And as a person from the world of books, he's got the classic subtitle on one of his books called The Bus. It grew out of a, public, of a pop art project of a full-size photograph of a bus on canvas that a copy of that is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. But then Mason says, not going to stop there. He and his buddies would fold an entire photograph of the bus into a book. It would take nine hours on the studio stage sets to do that at night. And the subtitle of it is, The Bus, Do Not Open in the Wind. <laughs> he invented the eponymous mason jar, which is at, <laughs> which is at your tables tonight. And he has had art exhibitions in more than six museums, including the New York Museum of Modern Art. And Mason has performed concerts around the world with pop orchestras, his own original productions, uh, and has impressed people around the world with his Oklahoma wit and ability and his creative talents. Let's please give an Oklahoma round of applause to our own Mason Williams. Please join us. Yes, you've already got a standing ovation. And that's your water if you need okay. it. Wow, okay. Well, it's always great to be back in Oklahoma. It's not only wonderful, it's thunderful sometimes. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, since I grew up here, this is the theme park of my youth. And I get to be a kid again every time I come here. And those of you who live here, they get to be kids all the time, I guess. So that works out pretty well. Thank you. Well, Mason, as, as we talk to Mason tonight, and this is going to be free-flowing. If you'd been here for the walkthrough this afternoon, you realize that Mason's mind sometimes doesn't stay on the script. So we will do our best uh, to, to stay on. We'd like to do it r roughly chronologically. And we will have images on the screens around you. Right. These will not be tied directly to the comments or the questions. They will be running throughout. Larry O'Dell has done a great job of putting this together. And occasionally we may refer back to a photograph. This should be very relaxed, very free-flowing, and informal, if we can make it that way. But Mason, of course, we've got to start your story okay. with your roots in Oklahoma. All right. Of course, right. you came back here when you were in the fourth grade, went to Hawthorne School. 1947, yeah. 1947. <clears throat> Tell us about some of your lifelong friendships you formed here, some of the people you worked with and you still work with, and, right. and some of the teachers who helped form your early life? Well, I moved from a little town in Texas called Rural Texas, and it was so small, no sidewalks, no paved streets. The only pavement was the highway going north and south and east and west. So when I came to Oklahoma City, I went, hey, there's a driveway right there into my house. How, I've never seen that before. <laughs> and it was pretty much true, because we uh, <clears throat> lived uh, just right on the edge of town, right before the cotton fields started. So we were so poor, we didn't have, um, uh, uh, we had electricity, but no plumbing in the house. And um, uh, <clears throat> so it was great to come to Oklahoma City and, and suddenly be part 
of a big city with all the wonderful things that big cities are. In Northwest Class, and tell us about <clears throat> starting, it was brand new at the time, and uh, <clears throat> you might want to recognize some of your friends here tonight from Old Let's see. I'm putting on my retro specs. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there they are. So, uh, <clears throat> um, well, I went to Hawthorne, which was in the fourth grade, and then I went to Taft in the seventh and ninth, and I went to the old class and for uh, a couple of years, and then I was part of the charter uh, group that graduated in 56 at, at, at uh, Classen. And uh, I know there's about 30 of you here tonight, and uh, what, a, what a great chance to be able to see my old friends again and for them to come and, and uh, help me celebrate this, this uh, wonderful event. Can we have them stand? Can we have the Classen? Yes, Classen? Class and class, stand. Yeah. <clears throat> and Mason, one of those classmates was a young man who would become an artist. My wife and I were just in San Francisco, and when we got there, driving from the airport to the house, we saw banners for an art exhibit for Ed Ruscha. Tell us about your friendship with Ed, and some of the photographs that you can see on the screens are Ed right. and Mason. In fact, those images right. up right now. Tell us about Ed. Hey, look at those white wall shoes there. <laughs> those were pretty great. Well, um, let's see. I, well, Ed was in Mrs. Lair's fourth grade class, and so was Dale Dallas. He's out there somewhere. I don't know if anybody else was, but... Uh, 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 I was a Cub Scout, and so was Ed, and, you know, the parents would sort of host troop meetings at their houses, and one day uh, uh, all the Cub Scouts came over to my house, and after they all left, after our chocolate chip cookies and milk, you know, always had to have that, Ed hung around, and I showed him all my stuff, and I had made, oh, airplanes hanging from the ceiling and model ships and all these things, and things that my dad and I had done together, and... Uh, then he invited me about a few days later to come over to his house to show me all his wonderful things, and it has been a life of show and tell ever since. <laughs> We're still in touch two or three times a week and uh, done a lot of projects together, some of which you'll see tonight. And uh, <clears throat> Ed's uh, sister, Shelby, let's see, there she is right there. Yeah. Welcome, she Shelby. She went to Hawthorne also, and... I get, did you go to Taft? Yeah. And the old class, and right, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, uh, <clears throat> One last question about yeah. Ed. You've told me stories about the influence of their mother on you. Can you share that story of Ed? Well, uh, Mrs. Ruscha was... Uh, she was always encouraging me to learn poetry, to listen to classical music, to um, <clears throat> read the classics... You know, and um, I still remember a poem she told me. Uh, there once was a puffin, just the shape of a muffin, who lived on an island in the bright blue sea. He ate a lot of fishes that were simply delicious, and he had them for breakfast, and he had them for tea. And then the poem goes on about how lonely it was not having any friends, and so finally the fisher said, well, why don't you have us for playmates instead of for tea? So anyway, that was... That's a poem that she taught me that I, I uh, still remember. Let's see. One of the stories is um, <clears throat> she could speak French pretty well. And um, I was taking a French class in, at the old class, and, and one day the teacher said, I want you to learn a French saying, and then you're going to recite this famous quote or saying in class. So I said, Ms. Roche, what should I say? And she said, Viva la says. So <clears throat> I took this, I didn't know what it meant, but I went to class, and when it was my turn, I stood up and I yelled, Viva la says. Turned out that means long live sex. <laughs> 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 and you never say sex in the 10th or 11th grade in any public school in Oklahoma, <laughs> let me tell you. So she sent me down to the principal's office, and, <laughs> and uh, he raked me over the coals, and then when I came back, she said, I'm going to show you what we do to people who <clears throat> break the rules in France. 
So she had made a dunce cap for me out of a piece of paper, and she made me stand in the corner and look at the corner with this dunce cap on until the bell rang. So uh, Shelby, your daughters are probably really interested to know just exactly what their grandmother was really like. You know? <laughs> what a troublemaker. <laughs> Well, Mason, you and Ed spent a couple of years in Los Angeles before you came home, and as you should have, and enrolled at Oklahoma City University. Um, I understand you have an interesting story about working in a record store. Uh, yes, when I was, uh, well, when I came, Ed and I drove out in his 48 Ford or 49 Ford, whatever it was, and uh, he went to art school, and he was going to go to art center, and they turned him down. So he ended up going to Chouinard and became a fine arts painter. He was going to be a, a graphic designer, but thank God he went to Chouinard and, and became a fine arts painter. Oops, I got off the trailer. The record store. Oh, yeah. So when I came back from, um, from L.A., uh, I enrolled at, at OCU. It was in 1957, and in order to put myself through school, I worked at a record store, uh, which was... Uh, right there just before Black Welder on 23rd. It, I don't guess it's there anymore. It wasn't Wilcox. It was up the street from that. And, um, oh, you know, I got to listen to everything that came out. And uh, one of the things I did is I decided to listen to every record in the store. And I just started at the first part of the rack and went down to each rack and listened to every single one of them. I'd stay there, you know, it'd close at 9, and I'd stay there till 3 o'clock easily and just listen to music carefully because you didn't want to sell a record that had scratches on it. And I, uh, Everett Gates was one of my t OCU teachers, and I told him about this, and he said, well, that's quite the music education. He says, why don't you go back and listen to everything you didn't like again? And I said, well, okay, and... So I was listening to Hindemith and Schoenberg and all these avant-garde composers, and I kind of developed a taste for harmonic ambiguity. <laughs> and dissonance, right. So, so that was my record store story. But, um, and then uh, I worked, after that, I met a guy named Bill Cheatwood, and he came into the record store and had a guitar with him, and I had just bought a guitar for $13. I did write a song called, it was a Stella, and I did write a song called $13 Stella. And everybody thought it was a prostitute. <laughs> I said, no, it's a guitar. And uh, <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> Billy taught me how to play finger style guitar, and he was really good at playing flamingo and all kinds of things. He was really a gifted player. And uh, so I was fortunate to run into him. And then he went away to school somewhere in Texas and met this guy right out here in the red shirt, Baxter Taylor. And when he came back, we formed a group called the Wayfarers Trio. Hey, that's us playing at the pad, which was a, right, a coffee house on 43rd and Western. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, right, just down the street from the the uh, uh, Will Rogers Theater. And uh, it was kind of the beatnik era, so folk music was, you actually were starting to make a living playing music. I thought, this is pretty great, actually. And uh, <clears throat> so we played at least three or 400 shows together as the Wayfarers here in Oklahoma. And uh, oh, we went on a tour with the K. Wending Jazz Septet. Boy, that was a thrill, all over the country. And uh, most of our shows were in Oklahoma, but uh, we sure had fun. And I learned about 300 folk songs, and I would learn every song on a record or every song in a book. Just why not? And uh, <clears throat> that sure came in handy when I started writing for the Smothers Brothers show because most of their comedy bits were based on send-ups, I guess you'd say, of f folk music. And... Let's see. Uh, uh, well, Bax, were you at OCU? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and Billy was for a while. And uh, <laughs> all I remember was us playing gigs and playing music. But uh, <clears throat> and I was actually able to support myself playing 
gigs. Sometimes you could make as much as $10 a night, right? Each. He's wondering if Mason kept his half of the $10. <laughs> Mason, when you were playing that circuit of coffee houses mm -hmm. and, and where folk music was, was gaining a new audience and these yeah. young people finally had the money after World War II to go and to be the patrons, right. what were some of those clubs? Talk about the gourd, for example. Mm -hmm. We have this illustration up, which is an advertisement for the gourd, a coffee house. In some of the others that you might have played, the Dust Bowl, for example, mm -hmm. some of these other places around the Oklahoma circuit where yeah. you were playing. Well, this guy right here, Steve Brainerd, owned the gourd, and it was a business he and his dad had put together, and uh, they served n no alcohol, but it was like cider and tea and coffee and I guess a few desserts and things. And Oh, I remember originally uh, we would get together at people's houses and just sing songs, you know, like in the living room. So in the very beginnings, the stage was like a living room, and we were just up there trading songs and talking to each other, not very formal. And But as time went on, uh, we were joined by Johnny Horton, who was a guy who sort of said, no, you got to have a real act. And so we got to be more professional as we went along. But the Gourd was a great place, and... All kinds of people from Oklahoma City came down there and sat in and did shows. And, and later, he uh, moved to a club called the Budai. Maybe some of you remember the Budai. It was a few blocks uh, away. But he was the mover and shaker for folk, mu folk music in Oklahoma City. And he ha had a club in Tulsa for a while, too. Speaking of the Budai, a little personal story. One day, Jeff Moore and I were on the, the road to Tulsa. We were talking about Tommy Smothers. He a biography had just come out, and I said, well, my mother knew Tommy Smothers because I have a photograph in her collection that's up here with Tommy and Dickie. So I called Mom, and I said, Mom, what year did you have the photograph taken with the Smothers Brothers? She said, 1963. Don't you remember? You met him. He was in town playing the Budai in 1963 oh. <laughs> and was on Mom's show and said, hey, you want to go out tonight? Mom said, sure. I met Tommy Smothers. Didn't know it at the time, and, uh, but that was my, my connection with Budai. Well, I'm sure he was more interested in your mother. <laughs> <laughs> but that's... <laughs> if I know Tom. <laughs> we practiced that joke all day. That yeah, worked out <laughs> great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, uh, we want to play one of the songs, that, one of the beautiful folk songs that you recorded and, and brought again to popularity. Before we do that, Mason, I want to introduce some OCU students who are here tonight. Yeah. And I want to thank <clears throat> Dean Mark Parker. Dean, would you stand up? The Wanda yeah. Bass School of Music. <clears throat> yeah. And Professor Matt Denman of our Guitar <clears throat> Center. Yes. So yeah. <clears throat> we have, will you raise your hand when I call your name, please? Liza Clark. Right. Jason Wong. Hey, well, I should add something. She's from Eugene, where I live now. Right. And I've seen her in a lot of children's productions back there. And boy, she's really great working with all those kids. And she's got a wonderful stage presence, too. So she really stands out. Oh, oh. <clears throat> uh, Jason Wong and Henry Bayless. Right. <clears throat> Audrey Oden. Carrie Morrow, Martin Lee, and Alfredo Vasquez. All right. <clears throat> so um, I think, uh, do you want to tell a story about Shenandoah? Uh, I will in just a second, but I was talking to Mark, and he said, I said, well, you know, when I was in school, uh, my teachers used to say, you got to quit fooling around with that damn guitar and get busy playing that piano. And so I said, well, okay. And I did my best to play the piano, but um, I eventually gravitated to the guitar. And th thanks to the gourd, I was able to learn all these folk songs and uh, learned a lot from all the people that were, that were there. And um, let's see, what was it? Tell us about Shenandoah. Oh, Shenandoah, yeah. <clears throat> well, I have a concert that I play called Of Time and Rivers Flowing. And all of the music in it is uh, about water or rivers. And it starts in 1767. 
and it goes all the way up through the most famous or important river songs and water songs uh, up through uh, uh, Talking Heads in 1985 with Take Me to the River and Once in a Lifetime, so really covered a lot of ground, and uh, it was great to do all the research on these things. And Shenandoah, uh, nobody knows exactly when it was written, but uh, they think it appeared in, in about the 1830s sometime, and uh, it was possibly about an Oneida Indian chief named Scanandoa. And, uh, but uh, some sailors came up the Mississippi looking for fresh water and supplies, and they learned this song, and they took it back to their ships, and it became America's great contribution to the world of sea shanties, because uh, most of the sea shanties were British because they basically controlled all the, the, the world of sailing vessels, but Shenandoah is really unique, and uh, Greensleeves is um, England's most popular famous folk song, and Shenandoah is America's most famous popular folk song. And did not you put that on one of your albums? It's on one of the albums you're going to get here tonight. Uh, uh, there, there's a goodie bag that you'll get later, and it's on there, and... Um, I learned somewhere that Shenandoah means daughter of the stars. Shenandoah, I love 
That's such a sad song because there was an American uh, fur trapper that came to this uh, uh, tribe and um, uh, he fell in love with the chief's beautiful daughter, but in the middle of the night, this, a French fur trapper came along and stole the daughter and he never saw her again. So I just want to say, if there's any French fur trappers, you're in trouble tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mason, of course, most people, or many people at least, think of you as a musician. One thing we've discovered in working on the OK Pop that many musicians are really poets, and many musicians are very good writers. Well, you created a career, not just with music, but with your ability with words. Share with us some of your early efforts to write songs when you were in high school or at college, and then take us into the story of some of your poetry and them, them poems. Let's see. Well, I wrote my first song in 1960, and uh, my first songs that I wrote were sort of like folk songs because I'd learned so many of them. And, um, oh, you just keep, uh, you know, running into new opportunities. When I went out to L.A., uh, I, or I was actually in the Navy, I wrote a lot of songs, and um, there was kind of a commercial version of folk music that was going on with the Kingston Trio and the Limelighters and other people. So suddenly there became a business to um, write folk-like songs for, for recording artists. And uh, I had a publisher in, in um, L.A., actually it was in Hollywood, Hollywood and Vine, in fact it was, and he gave me $200 a month, which was a lot of money then, to write two songs a month. And uh, I wrote a lot of turkeys, let me tell you, because about two days before the month was over, I hadn't written my two songs, and I'd write this junk and turn them in and, and get, my, get my 200 bucks at least. But, uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm, um, oh, you're just, you know, always working on, I, I, uh, I did look at my list of songs, and I wrote 75 instrumentals and 80 songs and 40 novelty songs, or parodies, they're called. So, <clears throat> can you share a couple of those early ones and some of your them poems? Well, my them poem, which was my first intro into show business, and the Kingston Trio recorded them. And here, suddenly, here I am on a Kingston Trio album, and they did three of them. And uh, here's, uh, I don't remember if they did this or not, but this is one of the most popular ones. Them Toad Suckers, it's called. And actually, Mike Settle is responsible for this because he said, you know, I was just over in Arkansas and I, I went across this river and it was, there was a town called Toad Suck Ferry, right? And he said, well, I guess everybody there is a toad sucker. And I went, yeah, that sounds like a poem to me. And sure enough, <laughs> so it goes like this. And I usually clap or tap something. How about them toad suckers, ain't they? Claude sitting there sucking them green toady frogs, sucking them hop toads, sucking them plunkers, sucking them leafy types, sucking them clunkers. Look at them toad suckers, ain't they snappy? Sucking them bog frogs sure makes them happy, them hugger mugger toad suckers way down south, sticking them sucky toads in they mouth. How to be a toad sucker, no way to duck it. Get yourself a toad, rear back and suck it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, one, at least one more. You've got to uh, share another. Okay, one of the other most popular ones is one called the Moose Goosers. <laughs> so. How about them moose goosers? Ain't they recluse? Up in them boondocks, goosing them moose. Goosing them huge moose, goosing them tiny, goosing them meadow moose in they hiney. <clears throat> Look at them moose goosers, ain't they dumb? Some use an umbrella, some use a thumb. Them, <laughs> them obtuse moose goosers sneaking through the woods, poking them snoozy moose in they goods. 
how to be a moose gooser. It'll turn you puce. Get your gooser loose and rouse a drowsy moose. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Believe it or not, there is a train up in Alaska, and a lot of moose get on the tracks, and they have this special thing that scoops them off the tracks, and that train is called the Moose Gooser. So. Robert, just a minute. One of your albums is called Them Poems. Yeah, that's, that's you, one of the... Is in, that one of the giveaways tonight? Yeah, it sure is. <clears throat> Listen to that CD on the way home, right. and he has more of those. Yeah, there's a lot of those. Summer. Well, you know, they're not all about sex and violence. <clears throat> <laughs> Here's a much more sophisticated one. Them hors d'oeuvres. How about them hors d'oeuvres? Ain't they sweet? Little piece of cheese, little piece of meat. <laughs> okay. You know, there's, there's just nothing like the classics, you know. <laughs> uh, well, as I, you know, as I uh, sort of in, intimated earlier, uh, your creativity uh, virtually knows no bounds. You went into sort of graphic, uh, uh, even the French stuff. Should um, I do them beaver cleavers for you? No, <laughs> uh, no thanks. Okay. Maybe not. Uh, that was about the TV show, right? Um, what about the bus and the Skyrider sunflower? These are, are a different form of art. Well, after I got out of the Navy, which was in San Diego, basically, I belonged to the Navy Reserve here in Oklahoma City, and uh, John Bedford who's here tonight, uh, Joe Rowan and John Bedford. His, right there, his father was the, uh, the big cheese up back there. I'm not sure what it was, but he was the head of the whole reserve here in Oklahoma City. So I joined the reserve, then you had to go on active duty, and I lucked out and went to San Diego, which was not that far from L.A. So I would go up to L.A. and visit Ed whenever I had a couple of days off. And also in 1956, when Ed and I were living together, there was nothing to do, so I read all of Ed's art books, so I kind of got an art education via osmosis, I guess you'd say. And, uh, <clears throat> but when Ed was there, we'd, uh, we'd talk about art and this and that, and um, uh, <clears throat> so I, I decided, well, I'm going to do some art. What the heck? And I, this is probably what happened. I said, Ed, I'm going to do some art. And he said, well, whatever you do, make it big. <laughs> so <laughs> I did this life-size photograph of a Greyhound bus, which is 36 feet long and 10 feet high. And um, <clears throat> it's in the box that he was telling you about. And uh, it's, on, it's on display right now at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and it was at several other museums. And then uh, for my second one, I decided to do a, a project called Sunflower or Skyflower. And I was going to draw a stem and two leaves underneath the real sun and have the real sun be a sunflower for, well, it lasted 40 seconds. <laughs> and it only cost me 5000 bucks, which is every cent I had at the moment. But... <clears throat> That's the way art is, you know. And um, so uh, here's some, yeah, that's kind of the, f that's the finished picture, yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Mason, tell them about the film that you were going to make with this, that you had a film crew there that day. Well, I hired a guy uh, to film it, and uh, when he got out there, he said, you can't shoot directly into the sun. So I didn't get anything uh, <clears throat> for my 5,000 bucks, but a lot of white film that is nothing on it, you can't see it. But I had written a piece of music to go with the film of them making this, and um, that'd be a good time to play. Uh, and it was, you, I, it was a, a pretty good composition, I thought, and I ended up using it um, on a, as a, uh, a video that I did for the Smothers Brothers, and uh, this was in 1968, and, um, <clears throat> um, uh, it's, uh, I was always interested in using new technologies and the slow-mo disc, which is the thing they use for, for uh, instant uh, sports replays, had just been invented. So I saw this disc and I said, hey, I want to use that for something else. 
So they said, well, okay. So uh, we made this film, and um, uh, it's uh, two dancers from the show dancing to my tune, Sunflower. And uh, one of the earliest videos, uh, 13 years before MTV. So ahead of the curve on that one. We're going to run that clip for you right now. Sunflower, music by Mason Williams. Let's see, uh, those were two of our regular dancers on the show, and that just shows you the depth that uh, the artists that we had on the show, they could, could tap dance and do all this other stuff, but you obviously could see they were excellent ballet dancers as well. Well, Mason, during the 60s and 70s, you either produced or performed on more than 30 albums. We've got your playlist, and we're going to have a complete collection of your work. Right. Describe the range of the music from, you know, them poems, of course, right. kind of wordplay, set to rhyme and rhythm. But then, of course, then you have the sunflower. Right. What were some of the songs that stand out in your memory as being something that you've, you've discovered something new or you've reached a new audience or uh -huh. it's taking you in a, a new direction? Any thoughts on that? Uh, well, let's see, I was never very good at writing what I thought was pop songs, although I'll play you one that I did write that I think was pretty good. And uh, so you're always trying, always going back, writing instrumentals, writing novelty songs, and Warner Brothers, Classical Gas was a big hit for Warner Brothers, and they wanted me to have a whole album of guitar pieces, and I said, no, I'm too involved in too many other things than that, so there's all kinds of stuff on all my albums, and um, my third album started to be more like a television show because I had guests on it and uh, let we'd sing songs together or they would perform numbers of their own. And uh, so you're always sort of uh, being influenced by from one thing to another. It's like cross training. You know, you you uh, <clears throat> uh, learn to write f uh, for television and that makes its way into your music, and then it makes its way into your poetry, and it makes its way into your performances. So it's all this stuff that sort of all blends together. I want to go back to your instrumental career. You're a guitarist, you're right. a banjo <laughs> player, as well as a singer and songwriter. But you were known for bluegrass music, too. Tell us the story of your song, McCall. Oh, uh, <clears throat> well, I... Steve Brainerd and I, we did our first 
my first performance was with Steve at OCU, and, and uh, we played uh, three folk songs. And uh, in the review, they said, well, they listed all the other people that played, and they say, but Steve Brainerd and Mason Williams stole the show with their rendition of three folk songs. And uh, we were never arrested for stealing that show. <laughs> <coughs> And I hope the statute of limitations has run out. So, <clears throat> okay. And uh, uh, see, where was I? We well, were talking about McCall. We're going oh, to yeah. we're going to play that here. So one of the things that I started doing was uh, writing, uh, sort of, uh, you know, music that wasn't exactly classical guitar, but writing uh, country music and other all kinds of other things. And this is a country tune for classical guitar and Byron Berline is playing the fiddle on here and Jerry Mills my man on player who was in the nitty gritty dirt band and uh, uh, <clears throat> anyway uh, Byron is just the most amazing person ever and he's playing the fiddle on this and um, this was uh, basically recorded in 1984 in um, uh, Birmingham Alabama but you hang on to these tapes, and over the years, I kept working on it. And so here it is, a country classical hybrid. Beautiful. It's also um, a bit of a hybrid because there's a sort of a um, Caribbean bossa nova, or not bossa nova, but sort of a Caribbean beat to it uh, uh, that, that I thought was a great crossover to have a country Caribbean song as well for classical guitar. Mm -hmm. Well, Mason, you were active in the television industry for more than 20 years, script mm -hmm. writer, performer. And in 1966, you joined another Oklahoman from Western Oklahoma, Roger Miller, on right. his television show. Tell us the story of, of meeting Roger, how he really discovered you, right. brought you into that process, and working with Roger. Talk about a production of one of his shows, for example. Okay. Uh, 
let's see. Well, I had produced a book called Bicyclist Dismount, and in fact, Ed Roche did the cover for it. And um, Roger ran across it on a coffee table somewhere, and he was getting ready to do this show for NBC, half hour of variety. And he liked it, and he said, let's hire this guy to write for me on my show. And when he found out I was from Oklahoma, he went, boy, am I right or what? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so Roger, uh, uh, was such a character, man. He was, wrote great songs, not only really funny songs, but catchy and also some beautiful songs, too. He, the full spectrum. And uh, he was uh, uh, <clears throat> legendary, really, in the business for being wild uh, Roger Miller. Let me tell you a quick story. We had played a concert. We, we flew to all of our gigs in a Lear jet. You know, why fool around with commercial airlines when you've got a Learjet? So we were in Tulsa, and we were ready to leave for our next gig, and the guy in the tower said, sorry, you can't leave because you can't even see the end of the runway. And the pilot said, I'll be at 14,000 feet by the end of the runway. <laughs> so, and just like that. So, and there were lots of stories, let me tell you. Did you normally write for for guests coming onto the show. Now, in your collection, I've seen this, you have some cartoons of an opening segment for Roger Miller to open the show. Right. The cartoons were illustrated by Ed Ruscha. So they you were, brought yeah. your buddy in, helping him make a little money at the time, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But then you would do that skit. Talk about working that way right. with Roger and then the production of it and trying to get your comedic timing and all and working with Roger. Mm -hmm. uh, give us an example of one of those skits that you might have done with Roger. Uh, well, I was always trying to talk TV shows into doing videos, and uh, I said, you know, I should go outside the studio and make films that you air on the show, and they could be all kinds of stuff. And the first one I wrote was, they kept saying, well, you got to package the star. So my first one was Roger in a box. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, this truck pulls up and pulls this box off, and... Uh, it's got a guitar hanging on the outside of it, and they bring it into NBC, and uh, they open it up, and there's Roger Miller, right? So I said, you said we had to package him, and that's, that looks pretty good. And, uh, <clears throat> oh, I wrote, uh, I wrote one for Liberace and uh, Roger and a walk for Phyllis Diller and all kinds of other people, but, but they were kind of arty. But Ed Vachey was kind of struggling a little bit back then, and so I said, hey, Ed, <clears throat> I'm making some pretty good money, so... Why don't I pay you well to draw these storyboards for me? And uh, uh, so he did, and it was about a dozen of them. And uh, but they they didn't go for it. They said no, it all takes place in the studio. So, uh, but that eventually led to the me doing videos on the Smothers Brothers show, like the dancer, one, the the sunflower dancers that you saw. So <clears throat> I was always trying to involve Ed in my uh, creative things because we were just living together and hanging out together and, and uh, uh, <clears throat> doing all kinds of uh, projects. Well, and oh, so sorry, in right. 1967, you joined your friends, Tommy and Dick's mothers, uh, for the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. Yes. And uh, tell us about touring with them and working with them. Right. Well, let's see. Uh, I was playing the folk clubs in L.A., and there was a club there called the Troubadour. And... Uh, Tom's sister worked there, and Tommy used to say, any weird guys coming through there with goofy songs and anything like that? And she said, well, yeah, there's this one guy named Mason Williams that has these funny poems and these weirdo songs that he writes and stuff. And I said, I think you should check him out. So Tommy invited me up to his apartment or his house, and I played him some of my demos, and he said, okay. And I made an album with him, yeah, right there, a week later, so <clears throat> that was pretty good, and I ended up going on the road with them for about a year, and we've just played all over the country, and uh, uh, one, one of the great things about watching them do concerts was after the show was over or during the break, they'd come backstage and argue, th would say, you stepped on my line, you know, say this slower, look at me when you say that, and they have all these arguments that would go on, and I, so that's where I learned to write for them was the arguments after the show. <laughs> well, we have a clip of you performing on the show. Larry, do we still have that clip? 
Yes, uh, Mason, before we show the clip, uh -huh. this is you performing on the stage, Smothers Brothers, right. and you all decided that you would be one of the performers that night. Tell us about this particular show. Uh, which one is it? There were 74 shows. Which one? Larry, which one? <laughs> censor. Oh, censor, yeah. Well, we had a lot of trouble with the censors, and because... Uh, because uh, of no. the controversial material that we were having on the show. And I remember the, the exec, TV execs came to us and they said, we're getting a lot of uh, letters from uh, viewers complaining about the controversial material on the show. And he says, you've got to understand, we don't want bad letters. We also don't want good letters. We don't want any letters at all. You know what I mean? <laughs> <clears throat> and they, they said, we want television to be sort of like, sort of passive, like being in church. <clears throat> sort of not too happy, not too upset, just kind of in a hypnotic trance. <laughs> so I said, well, <clears throat> I think I get the message. And I sang this song for him. Yes, the TV loves me. Yes, the TV loves me. Yes, the TV loves me, the TV tells me so. <laughs> and shall we gather at the TV, the beautiful, the beautiful TV, gather with the world at the TV and bask in the light of its love. <clears throat> so... <laughs> <clears throat> Let's run the clip. Uh, the next gentleman I'd like to present on our show is uh, someone who's uh, a very good friend of both Dickie and I's. And during the... <laughs> <laughs> Dickie and me's... <laughs> we try to make our show as honest and as uh, fluid and as personal as possible. Uh, Mason Williams, uh, just uh, a little over three weeks ago, won two Grammys for his uh, composition, Classical Gas. And I happened to be there at the uh, Century Plaza when he won it, and I was very proud to be with him, and I think he deserves a real hand for that. To, to his first Grammy. <laughs> and Mason was, uh, it came on the show when the Smothers show first started, uh, three years ago, was one of the writers that I relied on, I think, more than anyone else, because he had a little bit of rebel in him, and uh, when anybody said no, I'd, we'd talk it over and he'd say, yeah, well, you know, I think you should do it, or whatever. And we'd work out, work out plans and stuff. He was a strength to me. He's a fine musician. He's a poet. And he has a book here that I've been holding called The Mason, Mason Williams Reading Matter. It's out on Double Day. It's a great piece of uh, literature. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, I'm proud to present Mr. Mason Williams. Thank you very much. As Tom said a little earlier, um, I have been a writer on the show since it began, and I, I've really loved working on the show because the people are beautiful and talented, and they have a lot of integrity, and they do have a sense of responsibility about what they present to you as entertainment. And we've done good things on this show. We have done some great things, but you haven't seen them because of the censor. The censor sits somewhere between the scenes to be seen and the television sets with his scissor purpose poised, watching the human stuff that will sizzle through the magic wires and light up like welding shops, the ho-hum rooms of America. And with the kindergarten arts and crafts concept of moral responsibility, snips out the rough talk, the unpopular opinion, or anything with teeth, and renders a pattern of ideas full of holes, a doily, for your mind. <laughs> All right. In reading, reading a little bit on Mason the last few years and doing research. Can I say something about doilies? <clears throat> you may. You know, my, uh, my folks always had doilies on the couch, you know, and you remember those from your early days because I think it was because of butch wax that we wore and all those hair oil kinds of things that we wore. And so 
I say Oklahoma City was really wonderfully responsible for doilies for your mind. All right. Well, as I was doing the research, I ran across something that I used um, in a video production that will be seen this coming week for the uh, Wall of Fame, Oklahoma City Public Schools. And one time, Mason had to fill out a form for something. I don't even remember what it was, but he asked, you know, his name, uh, address, and all, and it had occupation. And he, he wrote, writer, R-I-G-H-T-E-R. <laughs> and you saw that in that particular clip. Well, Mason, while you were working on this well, mother's... I, I couldn't spell, but I got it right anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but while you were working on, uh, working on the show with Dickie and Tommy and that crew, you discovered a young talent working in, a comedy, in the comedy clubs, someone that you knew because you were both on the same stage. Right. And of course... I've already referred to him earlier as the only person I can compare to the diversity of your career. Tell us about meeting that person and, and bringing him into the Smothers Brothers team. Uh, oh, you're talking about Steve Martin, yeah. <clears throat> well, Steve and I played a lot of folk clubs together back there in, in LA and uh, around the whole area there. There were, they were some along the coast and whatnot, but most of them were the Troubadour and the Ice House were the two big clubs. and. Uh, <clears throat> Oh, since I was a music act and he was a comedy act, even though he played his banjo then, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, I'd either be in the middle with, or he'd be at the end, or in other words, we'd play all these shows together. And, uh, <clears throat> and one of the things I used to do is go out to the ice house and sit in the light booth with a friend of mine, Rush Jaguar, who was in the association, if, if some of you remember the association. But I would sit there six nights a week at least and uh, watch all these acts over and over and over and um, so I I bet I saw Steve act about two dozen times at least and you know when you first see it you're laughing but after a while you've laughed laughed at everything and you start to sort of analyze well just what's going on you know <clears throat> what's underneath the these things and it seemed like he had a real comedic philosophy going on and so Tommy said um, well, is there anybody that you uh, can think of that you think would be a good writer on the show? And I said, well, there's this guy, Steve Martin, who plays the banjo. <laughs> what else would you need, really? <clears throat> and um, uh, so Tommy hired him, and that was one of the one of the great kickstarts for Steve's career because he got a chance to write for a lot of other people that were on the show, and eventually was able to write for himself, which he did so well. And you eventually joined him on his first TV special as a writer, didn't you? Uh, yes, it was called All Commercials. And uh, he did a show that was a parody of commercials. And uh, let's see, um, <clears throat> I wrote a, yeah, I wrote this one, Okra Cola, the snot of the gods, remember? <clears throat> and so it was, remember growing up having stewed okra? So, so I said, well, let's have okra cola. And on the top it says oak. Well, not that one yet. Okay. Can you go, ba can you go back? You go back to oak. So I'll have to talk about one more. that one. There you go. But there's the snot of the gods. Carbonated stewed okra juice. And they did that spot on the show. And the next one is honeymoon butter. So this was a, about a guy that owned a motel and a dairy. And he... <laughs> He had the water beds in the honeymoon suite. So he would fill the honeymoon beds with cream and let the newlyweds do, make butter for him all night long, you know. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and uh, you know, he also saved energy, too. Yeah, that was a good use of energy. So <coughs> that was there that was, one. There was one more image there. There we go. Oh, beaver snaps. That was a cookie. And uh, I said, uh, Aunt Lulu's beaver snaps. And, uh, of course, the logo was a, was a beaver, and he kept saying, damn good, you know. <clears throat> and uh, there was another one I wrote called Black and White TV Dinners, and it was a TV dinner, and everything in it was either black or white. You know? <laughs> so, <clears throat> but... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, anyway, there, there were others too, but <clears throat> those those three or four made it. Well, moving 
back from the ridiculous to the sublime. <laughs> uh, you and Tommy, I believe, co-wrote the theme. For oh, no, the it was show. me and Nancy Ames. Ah. Any, any of you remember Nancy Ames? Yeah, she was this beautiful bl blonde bombshell that was on, that was the week that was, and she sang all the parodies and things. And uh, uh, so we were in Las Vegas, and uh, the show was going to have to have a theme. And uh, so I was fooling around on the guitar, and I was in the key of C, and I m made a mistake and went to an E chord by mistake, and then I slid it up to the F, and I said, hey, that mistake sounded pretty good. And Nancy said, yeah, you know, the Smothers Brothers' whole career is based on mistakes. <laughs> so why don't we write a song where it has the, the mistake in it over and over and over? So when you hear this thing sliding up to the right chord, that was the beginning of the Smothers Brothers theme. And I think our OCU students are going to play yeah. that thing for us. Thank you. Right, let me say one more thing. Well, it was an instrumental, but I did write a verse to it, and it went like this. It's the Smothers Brothers, a showbiz act with a sibling complex. They might as well be married. Lots of arguments and no sex. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Mason, of course, there are so many memories that all of us have about that show. Mm. Of course, one of our favorite characters this election season, we think of Pat Paulson, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And can you tell us how you work Pat into the flow of the show and in sure. mm. your association with him? You even went on stages with pop orchestras. Just tell about your friendship with Pat. Well, Tommy was very generous about letting people he'd worked with or friends uh, uh, have a spot on the show, and if they really connected, then <clears throat> they might even become a regular, and that was what happened with Pat. He had such a great deadpan face that he was great on TV, and um, back in those days, uh, the uh, each uh, uh, channel uh, had a, they would have what's called an editorial at the end of the broadcast day, and they talk about some issue or something that was important, and Tommy wanted to do a satire of one of those. He asked me to write it, and I said, okay, well, there's this law on the books in Pasadena called, and it says, it is against the law to lurk with the intent to loom. <laughs> <laughs> it's still on the books in London, believe it or not. <clears throat> so, you know, stop and frisk. I don't know why you need that when all you have to do is arrest somebody from lurking with the intent to loom. <laughs> right. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> I wrote this thing, and Tommy couldn't be anybody but Tommy, so we said, well, we got to try somebody else to do this, and so, well, let's try Pat, and he, he worked out so great that that was, he did about eight or ten of these editorials about different things, and I wrote one about censorship, and one of my, my best lines in it was, well, you know, the Bill of Rights guarantees us freedom of speech. Unfortunately, it doesn't say anything about freedom of hearing, does it? <laughs> So, well, Mason, let's uh, let's finish uh, the night with the story of classical gas. Okay. So many people are familiar with that. It's the most recorded instrumental guitar song. Can I, of can I tell one story about OCU? Obviously. All right. This is my favorite story about OCU. 
Uh, I was there in 1957, 58, 59, and half of 1960. But the dean of women was Dean Melton. And I was talking to Don Gardner, one of my cl classmates out there, and they said, boy, she was a tough cookie. You didn't get away with anything with her. And the first, uh, the first week of any new semester, she held this uh, meeting with all the freshman girls and uh, <clears throat> would say things like, you know, you're not teenage girls anymore. You're young women, and you've got to act accordingly, you know. Uh, your teachers and your parents aren't looking out for you like they like you're used to, so you're on your own and you <clears throat> so don't be late for class, do your homework, have lots of extracurricular activities, and respect your teachers and your fellow students and she, there were lots of other things she talked about, but her her concluding remarks were she said you got to be careful because you're all beautiful young girls, and all these boys are going to be <clears throat> after you, so to speak. And one of the things she said, I'll never forget this, she said, don't wear polka dot dresses. Because <laughs> polka dot dresses get men excited. And, uh, <laughs> and I th I'm not sure why, but <clears throat> she was the dean. What the hell do I know, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> and she said, and if you happen to go to a, a frat party and there's no place to sit, and you have to sit on a young man's lap, make sure there is a newspaper or a magazine between your lap and his, right? <laughs> Daily Oklahoman was glad, glad to hear about this, I'm sure. <laughs> well, so, now, now I understand more about classical gas. Right, well, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but her concluding remarks were, and you know, uh, I think I have to, uh, the last thing I want to let you know is that you're very attractive, and I don't want you to get romantically involved with a student and get pregnant, because 30 minutes of pleasure could ruin your entire future. And then she'd say, any questions? And the girl raised her hand, and the dean said, yes. And the girl said, how do you make it last 30 minutes? He snuck that one in on me. Uh, I, earlier I said, there, no, you can't, you can't tell that story on stage. But uh, you did it anyway. Little mother's brother still in, right. um, Mason. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, classical gas. Oh, yeah. Now, of course, the association uh, with, you know, your friend who helped teach you. Oh, yeah. My friend, um, Billy Cheatwood was a great fingerstyle player, so I learned to play fingerstyle guitar from him, and I was never very good with the pick, but that's okay. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I went to a party that, that uh, Roger Miller was at, and they would make a circle, and all these great guitarists would play all kinds of songs and things. Uh, uh, who's the guy that did pipe, Pipeline? Uh, uh, Dwayne Eddy. Dwayne Eddy, right. God, he was there, and man, could he play. And uh, Thumbs Carlisle, who was the guy that played in his lap, with, he was Roger's guitarist, and Sonny Curtis. I mean, it was, but they passed the guitar around to me, and I didn't have anything I could play except maybe accompaniment to a folk song. So I went home, and I said, by golly, next time they have a circle and they pass the guitar to me, I'm going to have something to play. So Classical Gas was really written as a guitar piece to play at parties. And... Uh, but when I started writing it, <clears throat> I had realized all of the things I had learned at OCU, because you studied harmony and counterpoint and uh, all the forms, the Sonata Allegro form, forms and different things like that. So I just put everything I'd learned uh, into the tune, and um, I won't go into the details, but, it, but uh, <clears throat> I think that's what made it great, is that it um, uh, included all these things I learned from my wonderful teachers, and uh, they were indelible, I have to say. So uh, OCU is enormously important in my, uh, my career and for classical gas. So you guys are going to play it. <clears throat> All right.
Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. You notice that bow was perfect, too. <laughs> they can really do it. All right. Thanks. Well, what you've heard and seen tonight between the music of young people from Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, the words that you've heard, the images you've seen, this is the spirit of Crossroads of Creativity, which is Oklahoma's story. We are determined to collect that, preserve it, and to share it to the OK Pop in Tulsa. Through exhibits here in the History Center, we want to share these stories of Mason Williams, not only in that museum, but with other museums around the world in the future. We want to share those with Northwest Classen. Right now in the Hudson Performing uh, Auditorium, we want to share it with OCU to inspire young people to have big dreams and to know that you can accomplish things like this. In this music, your work, Mason, has been a gift to us and to the world that will last forever. And tonight is possible largely because of the generosity of many of you. The sponsors for this event tonight are listed in your program, led by Cliff and Leslie and then others. The table sponsors are here. Please thank those people as we mill around tonight after the meeting for that generosity. And I think, Robert, you have a gift of yes, generosity for our I guests. I do. Uh, Bob, thank you for mentioning earlier the creativity that we seek to inspire at OCU. And I've introduced some of our musical folks, uh, Dean John Bedford and Joe Rowan. Jo John introduced me to Mason some years ago, and I'm d delighted for that. But we also have some graphic arts, maybe not as big as your bus, but is Mike Wimmer here, our artist in residence? Oh yeah, I met him earlier. And uh, I think we have... All right. We have something somewhere. All right, there it is. Uh, well, let's see. Well, it's, uh... There it is. Oh, okay. Well, uh... <clears throat> I want to say how big an honor it was. Wow, what a drawing. No kidding. To get to know you a little Man. bit better than. <laughs> did you draw that? No, I didn't. I, no, actually, Robert did that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I did. Yeah, and man, I'm that the, is uh, really good. Artist in residence at the school at Oklahoma City University, your alma mater. And I want to say how proud I am to be part of the Oklahoma City University tradition. Uh -huh. uh, it is a place where we give voice to all the students, where the students are enabled to find their own unique voice, and I am very proud to be a part of that, too, well, and to be you. part of the tradition. Uh -huh. I want to honor you with this particular picture of yourself. You know what you look like, but now you are forever young right? and forever talented, and you'll always be a big part of our lives, too. I want to say well, thank, thank you. you so much. Boy, that is thank really you, something. <clears throat> It reminds me of, uh, I was on the street one time in Kansas City with uh, Andy Williams, and we were crossing a street, and a woman walked up and said, are you Andy Williams? He said, yeah. And she says, you know, you look just like him. <laughs> <laughs> Looks just like me, no kidding. <laughs> Mike, thank you for, thank for you, this. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, boy, that is really something. And, and in <clears throat> terms of generosity, Artists like Joe Rowan has been doing interviews with us. Jane Giroux gave us her collections a couple of years ago, and some of you in here have donated either right. funds or time wow. or efforts or your connections or your collections to us. Well, Mason uh, has a collection, and he is an archivist. He has organized that collection, and tonight he wants to donate something to you, the people of the state of Oklahoma. Right. Would you uh, kind of set this up right. and... Uh, Explain what you're giving to the people of Oklahoma, Mason. Okay. Well, uh, this is a hat that I used to wear back in my Hollywood days. Uh, oops. 
a little more of that stuff. And the reason I picked this hat was that it looked cowboy and it looked Native American and even a little vaquero, you know? <laughs> so, um, oops. Yeah, I've done that before, so. All right. Well, let's see. And you can see on the screen him wearing this, this Well, you know, hat. after all this attention, I guess my head has gotten bigger. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. <clears throat> they are wonderful interviewers, let me tell you. And how great to see, make new friends and see so many of my old friends from from uh, Hawthorne and Taft and Northwest Class and, and OCU. Well, uh, just a, a fantastic experience. So thank you for inviting me and how great to be a part of such a great event. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> well, this is not the end. We will do other programs with Mason. We're still talking to him and his wife about the collections, his story how that fits into the bigger story of Oklahoma as a crossroads of creativity. So thank you for coming tonight. Drive safely, and we will talk to you again. Mason, thank you again for joining us. All right, us. my pleasure. Right. Good fun. And Robert, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat>